Hi everybody, we are back with our guest right here. This amazing person is Ross Tipograph. How are you doing, Ross? Yay, I'm good. I realized I need a hat, so I'm gonna do that. <laughs> you see the hair, that's why I do a lot too. I wear a hat on the bad days. You look good on Google chat, and then when you join a chat like this, you're like, oh, I gotta fix my fucking head. I, I feel, you know, I get ready and I'm like, okay, I look decent. And then all of a sudden I see myself when I get on screen, I'm like, why do I always look horrible in this lighting? It's, it's a so different bad. thing. The world just likes to change without us even knowing it. Yeah, it's it's all the perceptions. It's all a lie. <laughs> I'm ready. Oh my God, I love that people are saying, hello, Ross. Oh my God, hi. Oh my God, they're all so nice. Yes. Look at this. This is the Walker Horde, which is my community. There may be a few people we know. They may trickle in. Again, there's some people from like the haunt industry who come and hang around. Uh, I don't know if they're going to pop by today, but we will see. I want to say hi to all of you, and I hope that you are safe and healthy during self-isolation or quarantine if you feel sick. And I support this. Aww. This is wonderful. It's a community where people are engaging right now. And yes. like everyone can be more socializing. So we have people actually from all over the world too. So uh, like Shai is from Israel. We have some people from Russia, from Malaysia, like just all, all uh, into yeah. that. Thank you, Chelsea. Like I'm overwhelmed. This is nice. <laughs> So uh, do you want to, I guess, just kind of tell people in your own words, like a little more about yourself, like who you are, what you do? Um, okay. Basically, I am a writer, producer, and sometimes director of experiences. So like these could be live events. These could be virtual experiences. These could be immersive theater. It's all across the map. So it's different stuff. Some of it is like virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, either theater or just like a game. Some of it is large scale film studios who will want to promote their TV shows or their movies. So they want uh, someone like me or people like me to create these large worlds uh, that bring those TV shows or movies to life, which is great for me because I'm obsessed with movies and TV. Um, and then some of it is just consulting, you know, like working with like Broadway investors on um, them understanding how to make their content more experiential. Anything that involves interactivity, I come aboard and I help as like a writer or a producer to help the whole project come together. Oh, wow. And it's been a fun, unpredictable, creative journey. And I got to meet someone like you and hundreds of other amazing performers who are part of this world and like make it the best fucking thing in the world. That must be cool because you get to work with a lot of different aspects in a sense. You you know, you get to work on both totally. sides, more creative and more just like production, Legit. essentially. Totally. It's definitely a hand in both. It's pretty awesome. Thank you for asking. <laughs> so uh, what got you into doing this? Like, where did it all start? Has it been something you've been interested in as a kid? Is this what you went to school for? As a kid, I was always obsessed with haunted houses and theme parks and sort of like pop-up attractions. And I was always wondering like, like, why aren't these more popular? Why aren't they in more places than just like Disney World and Disneyland, et cetera, you know, or just around Halloween time. So I was always looking for something that was like a year round unconventional thing, like this exciting thing that you could just go to and have fun at. And it's, it's completely envelops you in its world, but it didn't really exist yet. I was growing up, I was in high school from 2004 to 2008. And then I was in college from 2008 to 2012. So it was like, it wasn't until really like 2010 that you started to see more of these things. Yeah. Uh, but then I went to college for film, for screenwriting. And I went to Emerson College and I had a great time at that school. And it was, I was studying writing because I was obsessed with movies and TV. And then I saw the 2009 Boston Sleep No More, which was before the big New York Sleep No More that everyone knows about. So I saw the 2009 Boston Sleep No More and it opened my eyes and it made me go, oh my God, like you can have these year round attractions. You can have this sort of pop up, creepy, sexy, funny theater happen in random locations and people are paying money for it. Like it was a, yeah. you could see that tickets were selling well. So it was something that audiences were really hungry for. Um, and that led me to basically just knowing that that was financially sort of like economically possible. You could have like a career out of it. I developed my own experience, which was this social experience for strangers. It was nothing like sleep no more. There's no walkabout. 
Uh, you know, you're not walking through a venue. It's not like Then She Fell, which I know you love. Yeah. So we could talk about that. So uh, it's not like those where you're walking around and you're choosing your own scenes. It's more like you're in a series of black box rooms with total strangers. And it's like you're acting out a play together. And the play is based on like a ridiculous midnight movie, like a horror movie or like a John Waters movie. So it takes things from improv games and things from like obsession with pop culture and it smushes them together. So I created this experience. And when I moved to LA, I started beta testing it out of various spaces. And then I started getting uh, hired to do private parties. And then I could tell that there was a huge audience for this in New York. Uh -huh. So long story short, I brought that idea of that weird experience from LA to New York and the rest is kind of history because it did well. Uh, and then I started getting like larger scale work out of that show doing well. Wow. That's was a that a rant? Was that a rant? I feel no, like it it, it's a nice rant though. It's, it's nice yeah. to see how like all the moving parts and how one like small thing can lead to another big thing and how it kind of just took you down this path. Thank you. I'm like blushing because every time I remember all the details, I'm like, does this sound crazy? Because it's like, it's, it's unusual. No, it's so fun. That's why I like to have uh, people like yourself on here. Because like Ender's saying, he's in Russia. You know, they don't have like immersive theater there. It's definitely like a new form, but I think it's such like an important part of theater. It's like one of those things I feel like video games. It should be respected more as an art form because it's just so cool and all of its moving pieces. So were you yeah. in LA first or were you, you're a New York person? Always? I grew up in New Jersey, right outside of New York. So okay. I basically was spending a lot of time doing like coming into new york on the weekends and going to broadway if i could and going to a lot of like indie art house movies and just experiencing a lot of culture okay. so, uh, so that's where i grew up but then i moved to la for several years right after college okay nice um and you're saying sleep no more was a sleep no more was a thing in boston first and then did you have anything to do with it when it was in new york it wasn't until 20 15 2016 that I started emailing with one of the lead producers and then in 2016 2017 he hired me to write direct and produce new experiences with him under a new company oh, so wow. basically it was kind of like an inspiration for me uh I wish I worked in it I did not but it was mostly just working with the lead producer and similar types of experiences afterwards nice okay so just like it had a pretty big influence it did. It um, was such an influence, as I think it is in so many people, because it was such a massive production and it was so inviting and it just made you realize that there's so many opportunities for other shows like this to exist. Yeah, it was incredible. I've never seen anything like that. It was insane. It was an insane, like, I, I just kept waiting for it to end, but it kept going and going because I think I stayed for the full run from beginning to end. Like, like three soon, hours. Yeah, three hours. So this is like a three hour show and it takes place on multiple levels and you can walk around and you're allowed to just like jump into scenes or leave scenes. So it's literally just like running up and down stairs the entire night. <laughs> oh my gosh, I was so tired because we came in on like a red eye into New York and that same day, that, that night, we went to sleep no more. And so it's just like a full day of travel, full day walking around New York and then going and to then sleep no more. three hours of walking around this like yeah. massive like mansion type space. Your legs must have been destroyed. Yeah, I fell asleep so quickly that night. <laughs> I kind of love that when you have those sleeps where you just fall so hard like onto your bed and you just like you're like a rock for like hours. Yeah, I definitely didn't. I slept. I didn't sleep no more. There's definitely sleeping <laughs> involved. What a good pun, Chelsea. Chelsea. Yes, you guys should all go there. If you ever find yourself in New York, sleep no more is good. Uh, then she fell, which have you been through? Then she fell? I know. Yes, I know. And we can talk about it because I know you love it. Okay. So how is that for you? Like, as a person who creates experiences, like, what do you want to go towards more? Do you like doing stuff more like Then She Fell that's a little more just, like, crafted or a little more spontaneous? I definitely lean towards stuff that's joyful and makes people very happy and brings people together. So I can find that in a lot of sort of popular immersive theater shows, they can be alienating. You know, they separate their audience to different areas. They, you know, make people feel invisible. And while that has its power, because then you, you as the audience member, you know, experiencing that moment being alone or you experiencing uh, being with an actor and kind of like a one-on-one -on -one scene, that definitely has its power. I just think that sometimes these shows have too much of it 
and then audiences feel alienated and they kind of want to feel happy and connected yeah. especially when life and reality gets like scarier and scarier which it feels like it is in this current era that we're in right now yeah. but so i'm much more into connecting audiences in groups and making sure that whether they're all strangers and they're meeting for the first time or they're already friends they become better friends I just want everyone to have a good time. Yeah, that's nice. Like overall, you care about everyone's experiences, not just like one person getting a really cool one-on-one, you know? <laughs> I feed off of it. Yeah. I literally feed off the energy of like a group having an amazing time. I think that's what led me to create Eight Players, which if I didn't say it earlier, that's the name of the thing that I created that was like, you're in several rooms with strangers and it. I ended up doing it for several years. Okay, wow. Uh, do you have a favorite experience you've created or is that it? probably hmm ones that i've created ones that are original i'd probably say eight players is my favorite but within that there's 30 different eight players productions oh wow so the way that it works is basically you as an audience member you sign up for eight players you don't know which of the 30 chapters you're going to fall into and let's say you get chapter 18 when you show up to the venue you realize that it's a certain set of characters and it's a certain plot line and therefore you're not experiencing the other 29 chapters you basically would have to come back to a players and you know experience different chapters mm -hmm. it's kind of like episodes of a tv series or like i i kind of like to think of each a players show as like a like a season in an okay. anthology tv series like if you think of american horror story yeah each season has one major theme and one set of characters each eight players show is just like that. I've just chosen to call them chapters. Okay, nice. It's more like, uh, like I guess the, the format of a speakeasy where there's like sometimes they have like three, like three chapters that you go back for. Oh, I think I know what you mean. Well, I might be thinking incorrectly. I'm thinking of like vaudevillian stuff. I don't think I've seen a show like you're talking about where it's like a speakeasy that you can go back to for several chapters i just heard people do them like because <laughs> i read a lot of articles and i read a lot of those things and they're like this was like the third installment of the story and you have to like go back for to like get the whole oh, story i get that new installments i get sometimes shows are set up in parts or maybe the creators just had such a good time with it but okay. they're like i'm gonna make a part two and invite people back to the venue yeah those are cool I think of it more like Goosebumps, like how oh, okay. each Goosebump fucks. <laughs> yeah, it's different. I was like really obsessed with Are You Afraid of the Dark as a kid yes. and still am. Do you know that show? I know yeah. you're like five I, like or that three. That and Goosebumps was my life growing up. Okay, so Goosebumps is the greatest thing in the world. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Sorry, I thought there was more. Wait, wait, I think you're surfing the, the, the questions. Yeah, I was just like looking over there for a second. Like my attention is like, wait, was that a question? Was that not? Um, <laughs> scroll. I just want to make sure they are seen as well because sometimes I look over for one second and they're like, you missed my question. I was like, what? There was a question? Uh, I would love they're just talking about they love goosebumps as well, though. Uh, I think Rab said like, God, choose your own book. Um, wait, say that again? I think Ram was asking like, uh, choose your own book. I yes. Was, okay. There were, there was a set of goosebumps called Give Yourself Goosebumps. And there were like 20 or so books written only under that umbrella. And it was really cool because it would be a choose your own adventure style where basically you had to, you would start on like page one and it would be like, okay, you and three of your best friends are approaching a haunted carnival. Uh, turn to page three if you want to go to the merry-go-round, but turn to page 71 if you want to go to the arcade. So then you're like, okay, I want to go to the arcade. You turn to page 71 and you're passing all these pages that are from like yeah. other plot lines that you're just not part of. And then you get to page 71 and it's like, they're like, welcome back. You just walked up to the arcade. Do you want to play with the clown or do you want to play with the sheep? And you choose a page based on that. So like that was really awesome. So some yeah. of those books were Choose Your Own Adventure and I love that. And Netflix recently turned that into a TV show style format with Vandersnatch. Yes, I remember that. What? That was amazing. Vandersnatch was so cool. Your community, like I'm sure everyone who is a gamer has like huge, huge opinions on that as they should because it, it was a really big moment for like video game style television. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I love how my favorite game is The Walking Dead Telltale because it's like Walking Dead. But yeah, that's the whole thing is, you know, you have to make decisions and your decisions affect how the story goes. 
It has consequences. I love that. Yeah. I like it. I mean, it's very true and it's very real life. Your choices have consequences, uh, which is the hardest thing in video games. I don't know why I keep playing games like that. I don't know if you ever played Life is Strange before. I'm not much of a gamer, but I wish I was. Like when I was a kid, I was obsessed with like The Sims and Roller Coaster Tycoon because you could build worlds and you could like build lives and that was awesome. Yeah. Let's do another question. I'm okay. ready for it. Uh, so what is the hardest challenges that you face like when working in this industry? Oh, one of your questions. Yeah. I meant audience questions. Oh, but I, I was waiting for them to give questions. I wait for them, but sometimes they get too scared to ask. So I just continue with my questions. <laughs> okay. If there's not another one, then we'll do yours. All right. Guys, feel oh free God. to ask oh any God. questions. Your goosebumps blew my mind as a kid. I only ever read two, but they were awesome. Oh, <gasps> yeah. I love that. Oh, yeah, Lucien. Someone okay. said, can you ask him for some advice on getting started in this whole situation? Should I do that? Yeah, for sure. Follow your deepest passion. Spend so much time doing it while you're having a day job that it's like you kind of go nuts with the desire to like push it into the world. And then look at examples of things that have existed before that that are kind of similar. So basically, if you want to create, I don't know, an invention that holds bananas and that invention has never existed yet and you get really obsessed with building the mechanics of it, you know exactly how it's going to work. You're not positive the world is going to accept it, but you are ready to like release it and do something fun with it. You make it on your own. <laughs> And then maybe you talk to some people you know who have some money, because we always have to find the people who can finance it. And you say to them, hey, soft pitch, does this thing sound like something that could work? And then they might say yes, they might say no. And then you look at the, the market, you look at places, you look at previous examples of like a banana holder, like this thing that you invented, mm -hmm. and you just do some research on how they got their banana holder out into the world. By the way, this is not sexual innuendo. I'm literally talking about like a fruit <laughs> banana. Like just like I'm picturing like a banana shaped like plastic bowl. And uh, anyway, once you work on it enough and then you talk to some investors that maybe they could see it making some money, which is sad, but that's how sometimes things exist. Yeah. And then you push it into the world it's possible that you'll find the niche of everyone who's been looking for a banana holder in their kitchen. That's nice. That's a nice <laughs> message. I like it. I like the That's analogy. Like analogy. So yeah, if you're trying to make something unusual, keep working on it on your own and then start talking to people about it and then find a way to push it into the world. Even if you're doing it on your own and you're doing your own marketing. That's nice. Um, I forget who asked it. I'll try to find it, but they asked who was your favorite film director? I saw that question too, and it got me very excited. So I'm glad you just asked that. <laughs> My favorite film director. It's a hard question. So I am extremely obsessed with so many movies. The one that's popping to my head right now is a director called Todd Salons. And Todd Salons did these movies in the 90s and early 2000s like Welcome to the Dollhouse, which is the one that most people know. It was like this big, weird indie movie that did really well at Sundance. And then he did another movie called Happiness with Philip Seymour Hoffman and Molly Shannon. Uh, and then he did another movie called Storytelling with Selma Blair and Paul Giamatti. Basically, he's this insane, amazing director who I saw speak live once, and he is so droll and so dry. And if he ever sees this video, I mean that as a compliment. Like, I think he's even original. He's a unique human being. And so I just, he's so dry, but he has such a unique way of seeing the world where all of his movies, Welcome to the Dollhouse, Storytelling, Happiness, Palindromes, they have this sense of joy taking place in a world of like inexplicable trauma. Like basically what he's saying is our society, you know, whether it's suburban America, whether it's the workplace, whether it's, you know, how dating works, all of these things are just places where people are trying to be happy, mm -hmm. but those happy people are like suffocated by all of the elements of society that they have to like work through to find their happiness. So if anyone watches Welcome to the Dollhouse, Happiness or any of these movies after I've said it, 
you might think I'm a horribly fucked up person and I apologize, but just no, because these it movies sounds can like be- your life, to be honest. So. <laughs> <laughs> these movies can be very dark, but they have like unbelievably high ratings on like Rotten Tomatoes because all the critics are like, this is genius. Like this is brilliant satire. Like, yeah, like it's really screwed up, but it's so fun. So I love movies like that, that are meticulously made and everything from like the costume design to the mm. acting performances to the music are all about this level of satire that's being achieved. I think he kind of lost his touch after four movies, but I really respect his first four movies. Oh, that sounds fun. We'll definitely have to watch them for movie nights. We watch like Yay. movies together, so we'll definitely have to add it. Wait, who is we, BT Dubs? Oh, all of us, the Walker Horde. We. <gasps> Would you guys together. have movie nights on here? Um, yeah, on our Discord, which is like our own little community platform, we, uh, we hold movie nights where we watch movies together. Well, then I should start recommending horror movies to you, yes. like Ginger Snaps. Have you seen Ginger Snaps? I'm not. You would freak out. Ooh. It's a dark comedy from like 1999 with two sisters living in Canada, and neither of them have gone through puberty yet, so they're both like late to becoming a woman. And one of them gets bit by a werewolf on the same night that she gets her first period. And it's a dark comedy about this girl growing up in, in, in high school as she's literally becoming a woman and also literally becoming a werewolf. And her first werewolf transformation coincides with her next period. And it's just amazing. It's really feminist and it's really funny. And it has amazing gore. Like all the special effects around the werewolf are like state of the art. It's just great. I really recommend you see that. That sounds amazing. No, that that sounds amazing. All the horror movies. I agree. Um, I forget who asked it, but they asked, how do you keep uh, evolving your work? Like, how do you keep imp- trying to improve your work? Ooh. Finding new, genuinely amazing people to work with and bouncing ideas off each other and seeing work evolve because of the skills that we're both bringing to it. So you have to have like a really collaborative spirit to work in this kind of field, I think, because it's so unknown and there are so many people throwing different ideas around. There's so many experiments being tried. Like if you've seen a lot of like immersive shows in LA and there's like, I'm seeing a lot in New York. You live in LA, right? Yeah. Okay. Just confirming. So I didn't sound crazy. (laughs) But so there's so many different types of immersive shows out there because everyone's still figuring it out. And then that can cause a lot of frustrations with people disagreeing. So I think if you just really find people who you work well with, which are just most kind people, just approach nice people who are like working in the industry and feel them out, you end up collaborating on something completely new because you both are bringing these different skill sets. And then you make a new type of show. And it's very exciting. Oh, that sounds nice. I like that. That um, <laughs> Yeah, I just like that you're like, find nice people, which is so true, which people don't really realize. Um, like a lot you, of people have social anxiety, though, so yeah. it keeps them from really trying to find out people like them who are equally creative or equally colorful, etc. Yeah. So, like, it, it, I, it, I understand where those people are coming from. I've definitely had social anxiety. So, it, like, it makes me so sad to know that that thing that's in our heads that we can't control sometimes is holding us back from finding people who are just like us. Yeah, for sure. Definitely that and being scared to ask for the help, just, like, scared of, like, the rejection or whatever. Yeah. It can be incredibly daunting. Um, yeah. I think Milo, oh no, Milo. Okay, they want to know your first impression of me. I told them that I worked with you, obviously. So, of course, they, they just want tea. That's all they want. This is huge. <laughs> so, the project I worked with Chelsea on was called the Amazon Prime Video Experience, and it happened at Comic Con last year. And it was a series of four simultaneous immersive plays that were happening in like the same uh area the same zone it was outdoors so we can't really call it a building or a venue but anyway so chelsea i i (laughs) i saw chelsea in the audition room where i was casting actors i saw maybe 300 actors in one week there was a core team of us who were going through it and seeing all these actors and i was sitting in the front row of the audition space and chelsea came in and i'd never seen her before i hadn't seen her in a show before so we were total strangers and she was just like hi how are you? Like so polite and like so happy to be here. And I was like, oh my God, she's really nice. And I was like, okay. And then you started doing a scene and I was like fucking floored that you're also a really talented actress on top of being a really nice person. So I got like so excited to cast you immediately as I felt with like 
40 of the other actors. Like you just sense right away that people are easy to work with and they're also talented. So I, my first impression of you was she's nice. And my second impression was talented. I like that. And then you and I worked together so closely for weeks and we, I think we had so much fun. Like it was just a really fun part of that project was working with you and it was just beautiful. Oh, thank you. You made it fun though. It's definitely like, you're like one of the funnest directors. And then also, again, like you talked about movies a lot in rehearsals. I don't know if you remember doing this, but he would like relate everything to movies. <laughs> it just made me so happy. <laughs> Wait, do you have a specific example of like when I mentioned the movie during that? Um, It was like during like one of our first rehearsals. You're like, it's like this. And then you start bringing up like a song from something. She's like, it'd be like this emotion. I forget. It was a song from, <laughs> from some movie, but it was amazing. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, oh my god you're going that's our chelsea so talented yeah no. um so do you get to sit in on casting a lot then like or do you cast a lot your own projects yeah like it depends if i'm just the writer on something i might just work from home and like send it off to the production company and then they go off and make it and they do their own casting they do their own producing but if i'm in a project as a producer or a director or any combination of the duties I love to be involved in casting because I think it's important to match people to the material so closely and know the types of personalities that you're going to be working with. Like I said, it's like a really collaborative type of project. So everyone's going to be talking the whole time and figuring things out together because the actors will devise some of the material and they, they, you know, they should get like devise credit or like sometimes they get like a script credit. Like it's really collaborative. So I think if you're in the room, casting and you're the director or the producer it'll have a huge impact in making the whole project really quality okay that's so interesting to like know because at like for film auditions you know it's so weird because it starts off going for like just one casting director then it's like just pushed to people and people it must be nice just to like be there and get it done that's the thing i don't even know if that's immersive specific i think it's theater in general like the director really wants to be part of the casting from the beginning because they have a sense of who would be perfect for whatever the material is, or they have a sense that they are easy to work with. In yeah. film and TV, it's much more clinical, I think, where it's like just like a casting director, or you send in a tape, and then maybe months later you might hear that you're right. in the next round. So, uh, Do you have anything planned once this virus blows over? Ooh. So I have several like large scale interactive type events that are on hold right now or being postponed. Um, I'm excited to get back into those. So hopefully by summer, there's a really cool project that I'm writing right now that I'm fortunate enough to be in the position to be paid to write it. So it's a passion project, but also Ooh, nice. it's my job, which is nice. So, and, and I have a, uh, a new partner on that. He's this really cool guy who I've always wanted to work with. Um, and we're putting together something that's like really unusual. And I think it's going to be in New York City, uh, given what it is. Um, and it might run for like a limited time, like 16 weeks. Mm. And we're building the team for it. And it was so sad when coronavirus came in because it just like every single investor, you know, or like every sort of producer is just like, I can't do anything for weeks because I want to see how this blows over. So, you know, everyone just sort of paused and we were grateful to be on the project at all. So that's one that I'm excited to come back. I can tell you guys about that. But other than that, like right now, what? so there's several of those, but what I've gotten involved in right now, in early March, I was seeing all this happening, like a coronavirus, first of all, since January, you know, it was like a global event. And then in March became like a huge event in the US. And it's really sad to know that every single person who's working in the service industry or is an actor, anyone that's doing a job where they must interact with people and they can't work from home, everyone is not working. And it's a horrible feeling. And yeah. even most forms of entertainment aren't even alive right now. So people can feel happy as a result of that, you know, not that anyone would probably want to spend money on it, but you know, live concerts aren't happening and Broadway isn't happening. And stand-up comedy is not happening yeah bars are closed so all of these things people would go to to have fun with are just shut down um and it's crazy but it's necessary i can i yeah. more than anyone i completely support you know like what like governor cuomo is doing like i think it's gonna help i really hope it's gonna help flatten the curve of the virus so we're all just staying home which is good uh, but the reason I brought that up is because I saw all that happening and I was like, people are going to need something to do at home. 
So I created two new virtual experiences that have been running since Ooh. early March. And I have been managing them anonymously. <laughs> so I, I'm not going to reveal details because if anyone out there has played one of them, they will know it's me. And I actually want it to be completely faceless. Yeah. One of them is a texting experience where it's just Ooh. you at home texting one character. And I am playing that other character <laughs> and they don't know. And there's a whole script that I'm working off of. And basically once you buy your ticket, actually, no, I shouldn't say that it's $5. I really just wanted to experiment with our people. You know, I wanted it to be kind of like an arcade game. So this is the one that's $5. And the other one I have going is like free because I really just wanted it to be something fun for people to enjoy. But for this one, cause it was the new medium of texting, like a texting play, I was like, maybe I can put like a little like arcade style, you know, uh, tiny amount on this and see if people are willing to pay for it. And I'm going to give all the profits to one of the several groups that are raising funds right now for first responders. Oh, and honestly, nice. there's like a very small number of uh, ticket slots. So it's not like more than like $75 is being made on this thing at $5 a ticket. But so I'm really just doing it to experiment with the idea of like, are people, do people want to do a play that occurs over texting? So I am that person and it lasts for 20 minutes. And when you get your ticket, you're given a log line of why you're about to start texting with this character, what you know about this character. And then you just have a conversation with them. And through a series of using things like Spotify, YouTube links and sending news articles, like in the middle of your conversation, it makes you feel like you're really speaking to someone in real life. It's like that horror movie Unfriended or yeah. the second one, Unfriended Dark Web. Like I love stuff like that. I love like playing with all these weird pieces of technology that we have to use like whether it's texting or video chat there's just so much fun to be had in creating a piece of entertainment off of that that's so cool i'm glad you're finding a good way to like keep busy too you know keep yourself sane and still creating honestly yes it, like i love that it's making people happy because like i said i love making strangers happy and giving them these weird delightful things but i am also able to channel my coronavirus anxiety now into communicating with strangers and making them laugh and that is a lot of fun yeah and that really helps people honestly i feel like just having you know community or since like you're talking to someone is yeah. it's all it great could anything. it could be like someone could be painting with their friends right now you know maybe it's like or it's like a book club where like they read a chapter and then the next day everyone gets together and they video chat about it and then they read a chapter and then they get together and they video chat about it. I just think if people have creative things they can be doing right now, that's also connecting them to their friends or strangers over video chat, you'll feel so much happier. Yeah, that's so cute. I love that so much. Um, I think we have about like two more questions if you're fine with that. If you still I'm into it. Oh, we can go back to yours. I know we dove to audience, but feel free to go back to yours seriously. Okay, no worries. There's like only one question you'll see at the end. I hid it from you, so you actually don't know what that question is. I literally hid it in white ink. <laughs> oh my so god. You see, like, so the if I had question. highlighted it, I wouldn't be able, I like it's just <laughs> I can't see it. Yeah. Um okay. it's a dumb question though, but we'll, we'll get to no, that. I like it. Um I think a lot of people are actually asking questions. Uh, let me just go back so I don't forget what it was. Um, I think there was like, you can choose like if you kind of want to do both of them, but they want to know if you ever get tired of writing or is it something you like continuously love to do? <laughs> That's a really cool question. I don't think I've literally ever been asked that. Hmm. Generally, no. I'm obsessed with churning out stories. Like I'm a weird factory. I'm just gonna like keep churning out plots and characters. I have so much fun doing it. Writing is one of the only things that like rids me of anxiety. It's like weird because you're you're creating a world and there are rules to that world and you're creating structure. Like I have a feeling that like some of the craziest authors, like JK Rowling, like she, when she was building the world of Harry Potter, like on that napkin, on that train ride, you know, yeah. that whole story of when she started writing it whether or not that's a true story. It's romantic. Yeah. So she, I'm sure her building that whole world took her mind off of all the things in life that like scare her. And then she like, that fueled her. So writing is the one thing that I never get tired of. Sometimes producing I'll get tired of. <laughs> I but understand. writing, I will not get tired of. But I appreciate the question. Uh, what is your favorite uh, like experience you've ever been to? Like you yourself have gone to experience and just loved. Okay, so you know how Punch Drunk created Sleep No More? Yeah. Geniuses. 
and you know that Then She Fell was created by a group named Third Rail Projects. Mm-hmm. There's a third major group in New York. I mean, there are many major groups, but there were three that really emerged around the same time. And the third one was a group called Woodshed Collective, who I think are still working together. Um, they've had a few new projects lately that I think have may have caused them to splinter off. That's not fact, but I believe that's what's happening from what I read. Or maybe they're, 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 they're going to work together again very soon. In any case, for a long time, they were explicitly making shows together and they did... Uh, they would do these mostly free, like just non-ticketed, unlike Then She Fell and Sleep No More. They were always doing non-ticketed, non-for-profit experiences that would invite hundreds of audiences at a time to experience a piece of theater in a really immersive way. Mm. They did various things like uh, they took a, like a really classic play and they performed it in an empty pool and the audience like stood around the empty pool and like watched it happen. They did a show called Empire Travel Agency, which had you running around New York City and actors were driving you and you were like entering weird locations. That was one. And my favorite of theirs, and I think that this is my favorite experience I've ever been to, to answer your question. Aside from Disneyland, I love Disneyland, but I don't think that counts as an experience. So my, my favorite theater experience, it was a show by Woodshed Collective in 2011 and it was called The Tenant, and it was based on the Roman the the book that was then turned into a Roman Polanski movie. Screw Roman Polanski, like we don't need to talk <laughs> about him anymore, but he's very much canceled. But that movie from the 70s was very influential on a lot of different thrillers because it was like very grimy and like he made it after Rosemary's Baby, which was one of the best horror movies of all time. And um, so the book and that movie were the inspiration for this immersive play put on by Witched Collective. It was in uh, uptown New York City. It was like at like 80th and Amsterdam and like this massive old church. Literally hundreds of audience members were running around this massive church, which had been converted into like a 1970s grimy like apartment complex. And you could just go into like rooms where characters were living. You could go into like a fake movie theater. You could be in a courtyard. And you it was very choose your own adventure, sleep no more style. It wasn't like you're on a track, then she fell style. So you're running throughout this building you're seeing whatever the hell you want to see. Uniquely, the audience members were not wearing masks. So in Sleep No More, you have this amazing anonymity by wearing a mask. But in this show, you did not. You could see everyone's faces. You could see everyone's choices. It was chaotic, but it was controlled. There was a controlled chaos that created like a magic for me. And I was like lit on fire running throughout that venue and having the time of my life. And I've since spoken about that with several people from woodshed and they're like oh yeah like that was like our our weird baby that like sometimes people got maybe some people hated it but like it's definitely a controversial one of theirs uh yeah they're really interesting and i really so love the tip. i think that was my favorite that sounds really really fun actually just anything like that is super cool Imagine, like a 1970s like paris like like weird immersive show that you can just sprint through and like the creepy music and it's like a sweaty like it's just really funny no yeah that sounds really fun i don't know if you've heard like too much about jfi or the thing they're doing oh, yeah. with their 70s yeah, it'll work well. um you're gonna bring up the disco night probably yeah. right night fever yeah yeah, yeah i heard that was a lot of fun i've never been to anything like that but yeah it was just like a really cool like immersive club like an immersive uh-huh. nightclub. And I was like, this is probably the yeah, only way I would ever go studio, to a nightclub. It's like being at Studio 54 is what it seemed like. Yeah, I know, for sure. It's exactly what it was like. It's crazy. I'm glad um, you had fun. Did you, I know you are saying before, do you have a t-shirt you said you wanted to show? Or show off real quick? Oh, uh, give me a second. Okay. Here it is. <laughs> so, t- not that, not the one. <laughs> and I was like, wait, the shirt. <laughs> That's just nothing. The... Today is March 31st, yeah. which means that tomorrow is April 1st, which means tomorrow is, what day is tomorrow, Chelsea? April Fool's Day. What the heck? There's a horror movie called April Fool's there's Day? There's an amazing horror movie called April Fool's Day. And, and you have a shirt it. for it. It is amazing. <laughs> Wait, I'm trying to get her head. There it is. It's nuts. So April Fool's Day is this, like, throwaway slasher movie from the 80s that came out right after Friday the 13th was such like a big hit. So summer summertime slasher movies because they were making money 
and April Fool's Day came out, and it's so fucking funny. And now I watch it every April 1st. It's a comedy horror that's kind of spoofing all those Jason Voorhees type movies. And so I got the shirt to celebrate. I brought it out here because tomorrow is April 1st. Yay! Oh my gosh, that's amazing. That's incredible. I'm, okay, I definitely know what we're watching because our movie night is actually tomorrow night on April Fool's Day. So I think like we should definitely watch that then. <laughs> oh my God. Wait, people are asking where they can watch it. I actually have the answer to that. I'm going to tell them right now. Five seconds. It is... I'm looking it up. Wherever it is, we'll rent it for sure. Found it. If you have a Stars subscription, you okay. can watch it on Stars as part of your subscription, or you can rent it on Amazon, I'm sure, for like $3. All right. Sweet. We're definitely doing that. That's incredible. Oh, my goodness. Yay. Okay. So this is the last question. Every guest that comes on has to answer this question. Um, it's a bit silly, but if you could bring any superhero with you into the zombie apocalypse, who is it and why? Ooh, any superhero. Okay, I I know how to answer this. I just need to pick an answer now. Into the zombie apocalypse. What's coming to mind right now is Deadpool. Okay. Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool, because not only could he do an amazing job kicking their ass and keeping me safe, like clearing a path for us by like punching zombies and killing zombies and getting rid of them so we can find like a safe location, mm -hmm. but he'd keep me entertained the whole time. He'd be very <laughs> hilarious. And then I'm sure when we got to like the safe house, uh, we would like have a drink and just like put our legs up and like have a ball. And he's also really sexy, so I'd be, like, really happy to have, like, eye candy during this very traumatic time period of, like, zombie apocalypse. Yeah. So maybe he'd, like, show me his muscles, and we'd all laugh, and then we'd be safe. And I would have this beautiful, funny protector keeping me from the zombies. That sounds amazing. That's incredible. <laughs> I now feel mad that I did not say a female superhero because I much prefer strong women but ryan reynolds was the first thing that came to my mind no deadpool is amazing <laughs> you is. need it's someone really like funny. someone it's funny really well yeah oh my gosh you know who i also loved no she wasn't a superhero i was thinking of the female character from joker remember she was played by zissi bates she was like his neighbor she had, like, oh her yeah daughter. yeah i liked her a lot but she's not a superhero, so I can't choose her. She could be a superhero to you. We've had people, like, choose their mom or something just because, like, that's my superhero. <laughs> I thought I had to, like, strictly follow the rule and be like, okay, it must be someone from, like, a popular fictional movie or comic book. You know, well, I mean, that's what it was to me when I, like, came up with this question. But, I mean, I've had people, <laughs> like, someone choose Naruto from Dragon Ball Z. Um, Has anyone else said Deadpool? I think... I'm trying to think maybe like one person yeah i mean yeah dead deadpool's pretty pretty popular just because like it's the whole thing he's funny yeah so you know you want someone who's gonna make the end of the world lighthearted and funny and make things better you know exactly oh my god people are laughing is not from holding... dragon ball z i don't know i don't know anime <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh my I God. To... They're all saying he's not from Dragon Ball Z. You are getting roasted. It's okay. I always say one stupid thing each interview. So now they have something new. That was it. My stupid thing was saying that Ryan Reynolds would show me his muscles during the zombie apocalypse. Oh, uh, who doesn't want to see that? So Yay. I'm very jealous of Blake Lively, and I secretly think she's talented. If anyone has, first of all, she's gorgeous. Yeah. Second of all, she seems very personable and human, if that's real. Thirdly, if anyone has seen her performance in A Simple Favor with Anna Kendrick, you will be surprised. That is a great thriller comedy. I agree. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> no, I've always loved Blake Lively. I was like, wait, people think she's bad? She's just, I don't know. It's because of Gossip Girl. She got a bad reputation. Anyway, we're off track. How did I do? <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Yay! No, thank you so much for coming on. It was so much fun having you on and getting to hear more, like getting to hear you talk more because you're such an interesting person. Wait, I'm scared. Oh my God. Yes, someone just corrected me. So C. Bates from Joker was actually in Deadpool. I'm such an idiot. I can't believe I forgot about her. 
she is amazing. She was Domino. She was like the badass, hilarious woman who like works with them. Oh, okay. I think it's because I saw Joker more recently that I forgot she was in Deadpool. How stupid of me. I yeah. apologize. I think she has like a different look in it too. Yeah, she does. Different attitude. Yeah. That's so funny. Okay, anyway. <laughs> anyway. Well, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us. I really appreciate you taking the time out. I hope you are staying safe and staying sane. Um, if you don't mind staying on for one second, chat, I'll be right back. I'll say goodbye to you off of screen. <laughs> love ya. Love everyone. Thank you for your questions. This was really a lot of fun and just like joyful and great.